Hi everybody. Um, a little early start. It is 1.59, so it's not really that early. But we are going to get started here pretty soon. I just want to see who all signs in and watches. If you're new to the channel, which it's not a channel, I guess it's a Facebook page. Uh, if you're new, my name is Matthew Davenport and I'm an author, father, sometimes sales guy. I'm whatever I need to be when I need to be. Uh, that being said, I uh, decided I wanted to do a reading to uh, drum up interest in the new release of Time Loopers by David Hambling, me, Byron Craft, and John DeLafter. Uh, John DeLafter, Byron Craft, myself, and David all got together and put together a Tales from the Time War kind of thing, four stories, all very exciting and all uh, all basically interwoven. It's not just an anthology, the stories are connected uh, that kind of follow a Lovecraftian twist on basically time travel and a war and all the battles in there. I'm not an elegant speaker, but the stories are great, promise. And to that point, as I see people are still signing in, I got a couple people coming in here, awesome. Uh, I will be reading from the Statement of Andrew Doran, one of my own stories uh, from a few years back. Uh, I'll be putting out the third book in that series uh, this year, as well as a couple small anthology stories uh, in different collections for Andrew Doran. Uh, and then, judging by the poll, I did put out a poll earlier this week on what people would want to uh, hear as a second reading. Would be a little bit from The Trials of Obed Marsh, my story that follows a, as a prequel to The Shadow Over Innsmouth by H.P. Lovecraft. So, stay tuned. I will wait a couple more minutes for a few more people to sign in, and then we will uh, start reading. Um, that being said, uh, check out Time Loopers. You can find that on Amazon right now uh, and anywhere else ebooks are. Uh, we're hoping to have a paperback in the next week or two. Uh, and as soon as that's available, I'll put that up on my page as well. Uh, looks like we're probably there on people signing in. People join in anyway as they go. So I will go ahead and start with the statement of Andrew Doran. And I will do my best to uh, oh, not drop the camera. There we go. I will do my best to uh, not stare at the page the whole time and look like a goober. We'll see how that goes. And if you don't know anything about Statement of Andrew Doran, it's basically uh, Indiana Jones meets Lovecraft. So monsters that are supposed to be mind-bending and cosmic and, and seem supernatural but are rooted in some sort of alien science uh, versus your good old average day, average pulpy archaeologist. My Kindle's taking a minute. All right. <laughs> Chapter 1. Miskatonic University. The sun beat down on me with a ferocity that I'd only seen before in the boxing matches. This form of punishment had taken me completely by surprise. This surprise had lost its edge about three hours previously, and I was long since past caring about it. My initial surprise was due to the nature of the execution. I was being hanged by my wrists in the Mexico sun, and I was naked. This was completely out of character for the Night Watchers, the Midnight Tribe. An offshoot of the Aztec that had managed to survive their collapse, the Night Watchers had taken to the worship, taken to the worship of Night Gaunts, man-shaped horrors with no faces and large bat wings. The Night Gaunts were known in most cultures as mythical beasts that would ride the darkness between reality and dreams. The Night Gaunts were to blame when people failed to come back to the waking world, having instead been devoured in the dreamlands. So to be strung up in the sun is an intriguing way to die, given the circumstances. As I'd mentioned previously, the surprise was quickly put to the back of my mind as I struggled to reverse my unfortunate situation. That was three hours ago. I hadn't given up. I, I like to think that I had decided to internalize my struggles. Pressing my mind to the furthest reaches of my being, I was trying to use the teachings found in the dreaded book of that, by that fool Arab. Arab. In the past, under ideal conditions, I'd managed to enter the dreamlands, and even once found that I could affect the walls of reality from there. Sadly, I wasn't as mad as the Arab yet, and was a little too distracted by the sunburn on my more indecent regions. Surrendering, I opened my eyes and looked down at my bright red feet. As I stared at them, only bringing more attention to the pain, I got my first real surprise in three hours. It felt that the shadows stared at me for as long as I stared at it. My eyes kept at the shadow cast on my feet for what seemed like an eternity before it spoke to me. Andrew Doran? That's Dr. Andrew Doran, I croaked out. 
I obviously hadn't completely surrendered. I'd earned that doctorate, and I'd be damned if I'd die without it. Yes, well, Dr. Doran, then. The voice was educated and, judging by the shoes that had fallen into my vision, not prepared for the climate. I'm Dr. Stoll, Benjamin Stoll, and I've come to return you to Miskatonic. This had to be a hallucination. My mind was finally breaking and creating the most preposterous of circumstances. Next, my very beard would be crawling up my face to start a chat with my eyelids. I hadn't been back to Miskatonic University in almost ten years. This was mostly due to them banning me, but also because of my stubborn attitude. Miskatonic thought itself the center of all educational fronts and shunned looking in too deeply into the texts they label forbidden, but that archaeology labels necessary. They had become a bunch of tired old zealots who coveted their books and shared their real knowledge with no man. We shall refer to it as mutual disinterest. And yes, I am an alumni. It's a more sordid past than with any lady I've ever met. I finally used the last of my strength to raise my chin from my chest. This created a cascade of fire over the back of my neck that threatened to steal my very senses. The energy to let my eyes examine his gave the image of a man slowly sizing him up. At least I hope that it did. Dr. Benjamin Stoll was bald, completely, and so pale that I figured him to burn up as I watched him. He was dressed in a full gray suit, complete with jacket. He had thin wire-framed glasses and a thick mustache that put my beard to shame. It took my sunbathed brain a minute or two to comprehend, but he wasn't sweating, and he wasn't even red. I'm most likely the, I'm most likely the most traveled man to ever ed graduate from that cursed school, and would normally take the time to place his clothing, his dialect, even his lineage, based on physical characteristics. In this instance, there was no need. Miskatonic sent you? You mean the Department of Archaeology sent you? Why send a Shagoth when the sun would have done the job for you? The man-shaped monster smiled. While consuming your essence would satisfy me beyond your comprehension, I have been compelled, via the means of Miskatonic's disposal, to invite you to Miskatonic for a discussion. Sending myself is meant to be an indication towards the urgency of the request. He kept smiling as if he forgot how to stop, and reached out and over my head. I hadn't seen a blade, and he obviously hadn't exerted himself. It was a Shagath displaying his inhuman characteristics to a man in no place to do that which came normally to him. I've made it my occupation to kill the soul-sucking Shagaths and all their ilk from the Necronomicon. Being aided by one disgusts me, but a slight smile found my burned and tired face as I threw that as I knew that the Earth's sun wasn't healthy for Ishigoth. As a man, as a matter of fact, Dr. Stoll probably felt as burnt up as I did. On top of all my deep-seated hate for this, his kind, Dr. Stoll had also been sent by that damned school to collect me, as if I would ever be in their employ. I no sooner hit the ground than I raised my weakened hands and shouted in a harsh voice, Kathongin Flagongnik! It was mostly a bunch of cross consonants with a vowel or two mixed together. It sounded like a phlegmy barking cough, and this was only made more cough-like by my sun-baked voice. These were words, though, ancient and all-powerful words that came directly from the book of the Necronomicon, and, was as, and as with all knowledge gained from that book, it had come to serve me well over the years. Darkness leapt from my hands and engulfed the Shagoth, and all about his body came a stiffening and a final shudder as he found that he could no longer move. The effort snapped the last of my strength, and I collapsed to the baked earth, unable to even lift my head. Shagoths, as with every monster and beastie in the ne Necronomicon, didn't need mouths to talk, and this one was chattier than my beloved sister. Release me. You will not be able to leave this desert in your current situation. I have been compelled and am incapable of killing you. You will be safe with me. Of course, the monster was right. We were hundreds of miles from civilization, and the magics of the Shagoth could get me anywhere safer than here. My hate for the evils that prey on mankind, no matter how domesticated, knew no bounds. From my prone position, I squeezed my fist, tightening my magical grip on the beast. This last effort drained me even further, and I dropped my head to the sand. Without looking, I could feel my spell snap as the Shagoth broke my ever-weakening grasp. In the matter of an instant, I was at eye level with the monster, but I was not upright. A slimy shadow had tentacled out of the monster's human abdomen and spiraled around my body, holding me upside down. You are food, and somewhere in the long line of your being food, you and your people have forgotten your place. You are known to us, Dr. Andrew Doran. We call you the Kloglofloth. It has no equivalent in your mind. 
but the closest I can come to a translation would be the cockroach that bites. You are insects to us, and you, Dr. Doran, above all of the other cockroaches, are in dire need of a lesson. During this intrusion into my mind, he'd been absorbing my soul through his contact with me. He couldn't kill me, as he'd said previously, but it didn't stop him from taking a sip. Even this close to death, you have so much soul. Through gritted teeth, I said, enjoy the taste and take note of its flavor. You're going to find something hidden underneath my strong survival sense. That steel determination. Compelled or not, I will kill you and all your kind. I spat, as I said lastly, taste my conviction. The facial expressions of the Shagath in human form are impossible to read on the best of days. They've never taken the time to learn our mannerisms, and why should they? We don't take the time to learn a cow's mannerisms as we're eating a juicy steak. Years of hunting them, killing them, and running from them had taught me to look for little tells, and as the Shagath drank from me, I saw one of those clues. His entire image wavered. His mind had been hit by a strong enough surprise that he'd let the grip on his projected illusion slip. Just for a second. I saw him then, as I always saw him, but also with my eyes. He was a perfect specimen of a disgusting species. A collection of mouths and tentacles all drifting in an amorphous blob of some dark and oily substance. Those many mouths had tasted my soul, and he'd been scared by what he had found. Painfully, I was on the ground again. And before I could do anything to object, the Shagoth had reached down and touched my forehead with cold, imaginary man-hands. In that moment, we were transported across space and through the void between distances. The nightmares of the mind dwell in the void, and I did my best to keep my mind's eye closed during the trip, but I was far too weak to keep all the horrors out. We landed in a library with a high ceiling and several chairs. The smell of a cigar touched my nostrils and reminded me of something that I couldn't place. Something dark and invasive from my split-second trip in the void. I was shivering from the trip, not from the cold as it looked to be surprisingly warm in the New England town of Arkham. Shagoths, you can dress them up, compel them to do your dirty work, but they don't have the common decency to dress a man before dropping his naked self in my library. I don't like to beat around the bush, and I had no energy to jump up and punch Dean Brandon Smythe in his smug mouth, so I spoke my mind. Smythe, I spat. You're messing with monsters if as if yeah. You're messing with monsters as if they were puppies. They, this one is going to break his leash, and I hope I'm there to watch him flay you alive. The dean crouched before me and looked me in the eyes. Yes, well, it's good to see you haven't lost your bark. He touched my chin, and I felt dirtier than three hours in the desert sun and being touched by a shagoth had made me. If you've finished being disagreeable, I'd like to get you cleaned up and dressed, at which point I'd like to explain why we didn't just let you die in the desert. Is this agreeable? I grunted, and he must have accepted it as an affirmative. I wasn't sure if it was, but I wanted pants and a very cold shower. Besides, Miskatonic has always had something I wanted, and I wasn't going to pass up a chance to finally get my hands on it, no matter how remote the chance was. I don't remember how I got from the library to the shower, and that's probably for the best. The void holds very little for the sane man, and while I confronted things more sanity-shattering than the void in my past, I'm normally less weak and sunbaked when I face them. I was dressed in a plain button-up shirt and brown trousers. It was my normal attire before I'd gone to live with the Night Watchers, and as loath as I was to be in Miskatonic, it was a nostalgic feeling of comfort that came over me as I dressed. I looked myself over in the mirror and was surprised to see that I didn't look nearly as bad as I felt. My thick mop of brown hair had been cut short before my self-induced insanity to become one of the Night Watchers and then destroyed them from within. But that was over a month ago, and it was had returned to its more unruly nature. I took a comb to it and managed to make it decent enough before turning the comb and clippers to my beard. I'm a firm believer that a trimmed beard is the only sign that humanity still has hope and took my time with this. Twenty minutes after I'd left the library, I'd made my way back down there. Without the aid of the Shagoth, I'll always take my own feet over void travel. Smythe hadn't left the library, and as I walked back in, he was sitting and flipping through a book. Dean Brandon Smythe was the embodiment of the tired old zealots running their vault of knowledge. He was clean-shaven and bald, except for wisps of hair that he combed from one side of his broad head to the other. He was odd. He was old, and odd, probably, but not old enough to have been replaced, yet although, yet, 
although I had heard that he'd chosen a successor. In regards to the book he wasn't really paying attention to, it almost, it wasn't all, but little yeah, tongue tied today, I tell you. In regards to the book he wasn't really paying attention to, it wasn't lost on me that there wasn't any book, just any book. Smythe was hold that this wasn't just any book. Smythe was holding the only reason I was willing to contemplate going along with whatever dirty work that Miskatonic's Department of Archaeology had concocted this time. In Smythe's hands was the only English translation of the Necronomicon. Miskatonic University had acquired it in 1918, more than 20 years ago. This, this translated version was the most up-to-date edition and included the most detailed practices by those Dagon worshippers of the Polynesian Islands and the largest collection of transliterated spells for summonings and banishments. This was the most complete text on the creatures that preyed on humanity and therefore the best possible weapon in my arsenal against them. Part of my anger with all of Miskatonic and especially Dean Smythe was that this Necronomicon was on public display in the library. Every couple of months, someone of shifty morals, or maybe someone who was just a little curious, would crack open the book and cause mayhem that would inevitably give the horrors of our world and the next more, and the next more ground in our reality. I emphasize our world. They have their own, and they are invaders, pushing into our world to cause horrors unimaginable. Some information should be guarded and protected from the ignorant, and instead made a tool by someone who would know how to responsibly make use of it. I wanted this book for me and to keep it from them. It was no coincidence that he was reading that book at that moment. I had chosen to come down, but I opted to ignore it. He knew I wanted it and it wouldn't be long before he offered it falsely for whatever he asked me to do. Thank you for the, I already lost what voice I was using for Brandon Smythe. Thank you for the shot. Oh, that's not Brandon Smythe. Hey, I wrote this book. <laughs> Thank you for the shower and clothes, I nodded towards where the Shagath hid, invisible in the corner of the room. In my chosen occupation, one of the first things that you learn is that once you've seen beyond the veil, you can't unsee what's been seen. And thank you for saving my life. I looked directly into the Dean's eyes. Now tell me what you want so I can spit into your face for a specific reason. All the charm as usual, Doctor. Smythe threw the Necronomicon he'd been thumbing through at my chest, where I caught it and held it, not removing my eyes from him. I held my newly formed anger deep within me, trying not to let it add to the fire that Smythe had already earned. He just threw a book. Added to that sacrilege was the flare of my uh, sunburned chest and hands as I caught the book. Oh, would you stop being stone-cold angry long enough to hear what has to be said? Look at the damned book. I tore my eyes from his and looked down at the book. I chose to stop hiding my anger instantly. The cover was in German. Flipping through the pages, I found that every page was written in German. This wasn't my English edition of the famed book. This was German. Either the university had acquired a second copy of the very rare book, or... You let the Nazis take the book, I said it through gritted teeth. Smythe crossed his legs and took out a small swath of cloth. Nobody let anybody take anything. It was stolen. Taking off his glasses, he calmly cleaned them as he said, Go ahead and say the I told you so, so that we can move forward and get to fixing the problem. You son of a bitch! You self-righteous asshole! I hadn't needed his permission, but I saw no reason not to oblige. For years I've petitioned you to at least hide the book, securely in one of your many vaults. If you can't bring yourself to destroy it, then lock it up! No, instead you keep it in a very public room in front of children. I hesitated, letting my words sink in for both of us. I was angry, and I almost told him that I'd, fig I'd go find it, just like he wanted me to. I allowed myself a chance to cool down, but I didn't let it into my face at all. Enjoy fixing this one. I won't have a part in it. Dean Smythe put his glasses gently back onto his face. Well, now that we've gotten that out of the way, he stood up and stuck his hand out to me as if I would ever shake his hand. So you'll go get the book and then we'll let you borrow it under the conditions that after one year we shove it into the deepest vault known to exist? He'd played every card he had. That was almost the exact words I used in my letter to him ten years ago demanding that he hand over the book. He was giving me everything I wanted and he knew I couldn't refuse it. I'll need help getting into Germany. He nodded and lowered his hand, understanding that I understanding that I wouldn't touch him. That's easy. We've got Shagoths. I suppressed a shudder at the thought of the void travel. Weapons? I knew Brandon Smythe, dean of Miskatonic University, wouldn't give me any guns, but Smythe also knew that guns were the furthest thing from my mind. Borrow or own? Depends on if I like it, I shrugged. He nodded slowly. Then I won't show you my favorites. It was my turn to nod. 
turning my palm over slowly and generating a ball of flame in my palm. It was a simple trick and not worth anything in a fight, but I was betting that Smythe didn't know that. I wouldn't show you the fine china either. I sensed the Shagoth move and I could tell that Smythe couldn't. The Shagoth knew what kinds of weapons we meant, and I doubt that Smythe had ever been quite dumb enough to have told it where the armory was. Of course, I meant supernatural weapons. Talismans to protect, buckles to banish, and blades that dispel. Smythe dug into his pocket and whispered something under his breath. He pulled out a dirty coin, plain and not special by any means, but I could sense the static energy coming off of it. He'd placed an incantation onto it. This coin will lead you to the Miskatonic Armory. If you feel that you're being followed, the dean looked over his shoulder, but not towards the Shigath at all, even though that was his target. Dispatch your pursuer by any means that you see fit. I held back from laughing right in the dean's face. He just threatened a monster that he couldn't even find in a locked room. I silently hoped that I'd be there to watch as the monster devoured his soul. So that was the statement of Andrew Doran, the first half of chapter one. Uh, there are two books already out on the statement of Andrew Doran. There's also Blackest Nights that has a short story uh, of Andrew Doran, and The Tales of the Alazif that has a novella in uh, a statement of Andrew, or of an Andrew Doran novella. I'm also working on two other novellas for Andrew Doran and Andrew Doran Book Three, The Scroll of Nightmares. So that's coming out. Hopefully, all three of those this year. Uh, that's the plan. Wink, wink. Hope, pray. You know. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoying this so far. I've been getting a lot of texts since this started, so I'm hoping it's people being able to see it. Uh, nope, I lied. Nobody's commenting at all. All right. <laughs> uh, that being said, I will just go ahead and dive right into the Trials of Obed Marsh, depending on how fast my Kindle works. And for the Trials of Obed Marsh, we will be, uh, we will be reading the introduction. <laughs> so, The Trials of Old Ben Marsh, uh, it, it is a prequel story to uh, The Shadows Over Innsmouth. Originally, when I wrote this story, I wrote it because if you read The Shadow Over Innsmouth, there's a character named Zadok Allen. He's the only real human in the whole city of Innsmouth, uh, and he's very drunk all the time. And he talks, he says for maybe a paragraph and a half, uh, a little snippet of how the town used to be and how it fell to be this weirdo fish town, right? Uh, that being said, there was never any uh, expansion on that. The, the, the Lovecraft never wrote a prequel. He never wrote any, put out any other notes to it other than what was in there and what other authors went to put out for him uh, in regards to the same thing. Uh, so what I did was I decided to collect all those notes, put them together, put them in a timeline, and create a book that is the collective journal of Captain Obed Marsh, the founder of Innsmouth as well as the, uh, the captain that kind of brought around Innsmouth's doom. Uh, so here's the introduction, uh, and just, just an FYI, Robert Olmsted, who's mentioned in the introduction, is the main character from Shadow Over Innsmouth, uh, except they don't actually ever mention his name, that was from Lovecraft's notes. So Robert Olmsted, he's from that story, he's the main guy, it's who you follow. I'll sit back, and I shall regale you with another tale. Introduction. The inherent tragedy of a tale can be found in many of its aspects. When speaking of my friend Robert Olmsted and his detailed notes concerning his delving into his genealogical past, the tragedy stemmed not only in the depth of the horrors transcended on the small port town of Innsmouth, but also in the discovery of his bloodline's polluted nature. Sometimes the tragedy can be found in how far a person or group can fall from grace. My friend's notes fell into my hands upon his disappearance almost four years ago. Once I had finished reading his account of Innsmouth, as, a, as well as his revelation and subsequent notes and clippings that he'd brought back from his own research, my own curiosity took me on a dark and sordid chase for the truth. Now, almost four years later, I've completed my research and can recount for you, to the best of my knowledge, the tragic descent of the town of Innsmouth, as brought about by the bright-eyed hopefulness of a young Obed Marsh in the wake of that cursed book compiled, compiled by the mad Arab Abdul al read. Over the years, I have compiled a factual account of specific historical details, as well as a large portion of personal tales from nearby families and legend. Needless to say, this tale I prepare to relay to you can only be factual to an extent, as I, nor any living person, was there that can share first-hand accounts. In moments in which the historical or inherited tales fail to fill all of the gaps, I've taken it upon myself to apply educated guesses. 
The gaps, while unverifiable, are the most likely accounts that an educated mind can apply given the evidence. In the case of the majority of this text, I was able to locate a collection, although incomplete, of Obed Marsh's private journals. There are gaps in the knowledge collected from these incomplete journals, and I've taken it upon myself to supply a narrative that will properly illustrate Obed's views of events while supplementing the holes in, this, in his view with historical accounts from other verifiable sources. During your examination of my documents, you'll also take notice of direct transcription from Islanders as well as journal entries from other crew from Innsmouth that would have dealt directly with the captain. It is my hopes to show the world how susceptible the strongest of wills is to the vile depth of the unmanned terrors that move to sweep our ownership of this planet from us. Yog Sathoth, the dark man Nyarlathotep, Cthulhu, and yes, even deep and dark Dagon surrounded this world to the stars. They surrendered this world to the stars. They delved deep, allowing for species of flora and fauna to grow and take their place. These ancient galactic travelers wish to take away all that we've been built in some ancient claim of property ownership. The horrors that they wish to inflict upon humanity in our world are unnamed, for they are unimaginable by the tiny scope that our mortal brains can contain. This account of the corruption and fall of the formerly beautiful town of Innsmouth will hopefully serve as an example to all who read it as to humanity's lack of preparedness. If Obed couldn't beat back the darkness, how can we? There you go. That's basically it. Uh, that's all I've prepared to read. Um, if this goes well, you guys can maybe accept, expect some more. That being said, you really should check out Time Loopers, not because I'm in it, but because there are some A-plus authors in there. I like to refer to us as the next generation of uh, people to carry the Mythos Torch um, and keep Lovecraft stuff going. I, uh, I think David Hambling, Byron Craft, John, we're all great writers. There's the cover in black and white just for you to check out. Uh, feel free to look it up on Amazon, and if you do, please leave a review. Um, I'm still doing that. Uh, I put up a post earlier this week that said if you can just show me a picture of you holding up your reader with a copy of the cover on it, because it's only in digital right now, I will gladly uh, mention you on my blog, show that picture on my blog, and put you in to win a print copy when it comes out. So please go ahead and do that. I think I'm going to run that to the end of June just to get some more pictures, because uh, right now I think only my brother's on there, which thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, he helped me write Broken Nights and Broken Nights Strange World, so please check those out as well. And thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate having you on here. Bye-bye. Now how the hell do you turn this thing off?